Hello, hello, hello guys, and welcome back to Joe's Ventures, and today we're going to be doing another Planet Zoo Mod Spotlight, where we take a look at a bunch of really cool, interesting animals that uh, modders have been making, and this is going to be part 31. I can't believe we've got so many parts already. We've been really churning these out. It's pretty much a weekly thing, and I've already got three more weeks already sorted, so that shows how much mods these guys have just been pushing out and pushing out. It's really cool to see all these cool animals getting a spotlight, so that's why I like doing this as well. So we're going to be starting with a really, really cool little duck. It's quite a common duck. It's called the Gadwell Duck, and this was done by... Uh, Romarion, or her name preferred to be called, uh, I think, Rihanna. And uh, this was also done by Bongo Hardwood, who's very famous for doing a lot of birds. So here we are, we're going to have a look at the... This is a female here. We'll find a male. Where's a male? They breed very fast, so you got to be careful. So this is a male here, by the looks of it. So these are the Gadwell duck, are a species of dabbing duck that are very common and widespread. They are found pretty much across the Paleo-Arctic. They're found in northern areas of Europe and Central North America. Pretty much found almost everywhere within the uh, northern latitudes. Pretty much. Uh, even in Great Britain, even though they're scarce breeding and winter visitor. But their population has been increasing in Britain at least. And they also found a place like the Great Lakes, uh, Alberta, Kansas, California, coastal uh, Alaska and such as the East United States, so very, very common uh, group of ducks. Very, very common. So, these guys are sort of a big, medium-sized duck. They are 46 to 56 centimeters, or 18 to 22 inches long, with a 78 to 90 centimeter wingspan, or 31 to 35 inches. Uh, the males, you can see here, get slightly larger than the females. A female usually is about uh, 990 grams, uh, that's a male, actually. Males are about 1990 grams, with a female being 850, so about a 100 gram difference, which is pretty big when you weigh under a kilo. So the breeding male that you can see, they have this, like, uh, pattern grey with black red uh, end, and these chestnut wings that you can see here. You can see the females are a little bit more drab. We you can see, where's a female? Is a female? A little bit more drab. Still a wonderful animal, though. Who doesn't love ducks? So these guys are a bird that live in open wetlands as well as prairie and steppe lakes, uh, wet grassland and all that, and they usually feed by dabbing their uh, beaks in the water, that's why they're called dabbing ducks, and they can dive underwater for food, most more proficiently than other ducks, uh, dabbing ducks at least, so they can steal food from other diving birds, so that gives them a competitive advantage. So they nest on the ground with some distance from water and they're not as gregarious or not as social as others uh, dabbing ducks and usually tend to stay in small flocks. So these guys are monogamous and may start breeding around their first year of life and their pair formations begin to uh, begins in migration in the fall where they move on to their breeding grounds but they have recorded to have been occur in August with this ellipsal pumid stuff that they've got going on. So generally quiet except when they are uh, Sporting each other, of course. The male uses like a merp call, so a call sometimes called a burp, which is quite funny. And the grunt whistle is similar to mallards, and where the males will outstretch their heads and uh, display for the females. And the young birds, as we can see here, after the, obviously the parents are laid eggs and such, you can see that they have these cute little uh, faces on them, and they usually they'll eat small mollusks and insects during the nesting season and kind of just survive on that and very lucky because they are least concerned because they are a very very common bird they can be found all across the northern hemisphere pretty much so they're considered least concerned and they're actually one of the species that have um, actually been increasing recently their populations have increased about 2.5 percent over the past 50 years and they're continuing to grow and they are the most hunted ducks and the one of the most hunted ducks so they're third to mallard and the greenland teal with 1.7 million shot every year, but luckily that does not impact the population. In fact, it's actually increasing. So that is proof that sustainable hunting is good. And with good conservation efforts, you could sustainably hunt them. So these guys are even increasing while they're being hunted. So that's very, very good for their populations. So yeah, really wonderful little Gadwell duck. So they're both paired up, um, Bongo Hardwood and Rihanna, they're both paired up to make another, uh, another little duck. But this time it's not 
like your normal dabbling ducks, we got something really cool. So this is made by the same two people. Uh, we're going to be having a look at the hooded mersanger. I believe how you pronounce it, or mersanger. It's a really wonderful animal. Look at this beautiful male. So mersangers are the only extinct species in their genus, but there are other. There's another genus of uh, mersangers. So they're a very uh, type of. They're a diving duck. They're considered. And you can see they're very different from a normal duck. They don't have that wide bill that you think of. They've got like a very sharp beak, which is pretty cool. And that's why they're not... These guys are particularly different because they have like a sharper beak. They're called a sawbill, but they're not classified as a simple uh, messenger, like a typical one. But they are different. So they're actually also the second smaller species of messenger, only with the smoo from Europe and Asia being smaller. And it's the only one that is native habitat is restricted to North America. And there are different types of messengers across the world. There's even an extinct New Zealand one that went extinct in 1902, which kind of sucks, but they're still really cool. So these guys you can see are a very heavily sexually dimorphic species. You can see here, this is a male. And this one over here is a female. You see they've got their hood merger, but you can see the males have got like this uh, black crest with big white spots and more reddish... Um, tummy with a black back these guys are much more grayish with a reddish uh, crest here you can see here really wonderful animal and if you're wondering why they're floating it's because they use a flamingo rig so they uh, usually measure about 15 to 19 inches or 40 to 49 centimeters in length they weigh between uh, 435 to 879 grams or 60 to 31 ounces and they have a wingspan of 23 to 26 inches or 60 to 66 centimeters so that's a lot of sixes <laughs> so these guys are short distant migrants and they winter in the united states uh, where regions are allow them to have ice free uh, conditions so such as the lower united states and they have two major ranges year round one is the eastern united states from the southern canada to u.s border along the atlantic coast to the gulf coast uh, as the region to the Mississippi Delta, so that's where they kind of live. So they kind of just avoid, they are migratory, but some populations will stay year-round, depending if uh, the water around there stays ice-free. So from 1966 uh, to 2015, believe it or not, these guys have actually increased uh, their population by 1.5 yearly population increase each year throughout its breeding range so that's very very good they're still increasing as well it's not all everything's dying there's still some animals that are increasing populations due to good conservation work so these guys are live in small bodies of water such as ponds and small estuaries where there's enough aquatic vegetation also white large wetlands uh, flooded uh, timber and rivers they prefer fresh water but they will go into brackish water So the herd of messenger is a diving predator, so they largely hunt things that are in the water. Most studies report their diet as being circumstantial, so that's usually dominated by fish. They also feed on aquatic insects and other aquatic invertebrates such as crabs or crayfish. So males and females of the herd of messenger, they will make, uh, I think we'll have a look at one of the water since they don't look so weird and floaty. Let's look at the male here. So. Males and females will pair up and form monogamous bonds and they remain together until the female selected a nesting cavity and completed laying your clutch. After that the male leaves and the leaves the female to incubate and care for the brood. So not very good dads. We'll have a look at the female over here. <laughs> so what she'll do is seek out cavities in dead trees or nest boxes. Uh, and they prefer to cavities 4 to 15 deep in the ground. Breeding occurs any time between the end of February to the end of June depending on the region that can have some variability so females usually lay a clutch of 7 to 15 eggs but only begins incubation when the last egg has been laid therefore permitting synchronous hatching so they will hatch in the same go and all hatchings we'll have a look at some hatchlings because they are very very cute where are they where are my hatchlings there they are where are they so we can see they've got these very cute hatchlings that you can see here and um, they usually hatch about the same size, where they, which means the parents can give them good parental care. And during incubation, the female may actually lose about eight to sixteen percent of the body weight. So that's what she does to grow her babies up. So, like most waterfowl, these guys are precocial, so they're pretty much born able, like born ready to go out the box. 
So they usually leave the nest within 24 hours after they hatch, and this is long enough to accommodate that synchronous hatching. And once they leave the nest, the young are capable of diving and foraging on their own, but they will remain with their mother or the female for protection and warmth, which is pretty, pretty cool. So these guys had some issues. The population declined in the past with large scale deforestation, and because they required on these cavity nesters, uh, these cavities that they nested in, these guys were often uh, didn't have enough breeding uh, places for them to breed, so their populations decreased because they required these mature trees with ne for good nesting sites. But it seems like their population has been increasing with uh, restrictions in deforestation, at least in America, and some in places a lot of. Um, old growth forests coming back so that's very very good so these guys have been uh coming back because of that but they are very susceptible to many types of pollution that accumulates in their food sources so poisoning things like that and luckily but generally they are doing very well this population seems to be increasing so that's very very good so yeah and have a cute little merce andrew i love the males the males have such a nice color to them so now we're going to move on to this one was only just made by Bongo Hardwood. We've got everyone's favorite menace. We have got the Canada Goose. <laughs> we can see here. Everyone doesn't everyone love a Canada Goose. So these guys are a very, very large goose with a black head that you can see with these white cheeks and brown bodies. Uh, they are native to Arctic and temperate regions of North America and they migrate occasionally to uh, across the Atlantic to Northern Europe. They've been introduced to places like the United Kingdom, Iceland, Finland, Sweden, Denmark, New Zealand, Japan, Chinle, Archetida, and the Falkland Islands for hunting. And these guys are mostly herbivorous and they tend to stay around uh, fresh water. So these guys can also get pretty, pretty big. They are... A male Canada Goose can weigh between 2.6 to 6.5 kilos, averaging about across the subspecies of about... Um, 3.9 kilos and the females are virtually look identical but are slightly lighter at 2.4 to 5.5 kilograms and average about 3.6 and generally 10% smaller in linear dimensions to the males so just slightly smaller and they also have pretty pretty uh, wide wingspans and lengths they can get to 75 to 110 centimeters in length and have a 127 to 185 wingspan so that's generally how big they are. And the largest uh, subspecies is the giant Canada goose. Look at that, little lumen. <laughs> the giant Canada goose is the largest, and the smallest is Paravis, which is the lesser Canada goose. And they can range in sizes and such. So, really, really cool there. So, these guys, as I mentioned, they're native to North America. They breed in Canada and the north, uh, northern United States, especially in the Great Lakes region. But they have been found in places like Mexico and California, South Carolina. They've been to be migrants. So, and actually in these recent years, some areas, uh, populations have grown a lot bigger, which that means considered them to be pests, even in their native range, since they will poison and kind of like uh, make water. They, the, their poop basically pollutes the water and they make it unlivable for fish. So they do need to be culled in some areas. But outside of the United States, they are a kind of a game species, so they can be hunted in New Zealand. Luckily, in New Zealand, they were pretty much... In 2011, their protection status, because they were a game bird, now they're like, no, we don't want them around, let's just get rid of them. So in 2011, you can go and kill them as much as you like. <laughs> but these guys are naturally migratory, as I mentioned. And they fly in these V-shaped uh, uh, flocks that they move down across their migrations. So they migrate from... California and the Great Lakes and kind of just do their migration thing. So as I mentioned, these guys are primarily herbivorous. They will eat insects, fish, uh, uh, sometimes as well. So that's like not a big part of their diet, but they will eat them. And they obviously are herbivores. That's the primary thing. And the diet includes lots of grasses, grains, beans, even seaweed in some places. Very, very not picky. And they will raid garbage bins and trash uh, in urban areas, which is pretty funny. So, during their second year of life, the geese will find a mate and they are monogamous and most couples stay together for life, so that's very cute. If one dies, the other may find a new mate and the female lays about two to nine eggs, the average of five, where both parents protect the nest while the eggs incubate, which is very good because two Canada geese, that's a great start to life because you are not going to be uh, 
if you scare anything off, so you'll be fine. But the females spend most of the time in the nest than the male. So they usually locate the nest in an elevated area in a uh, near a stream or a pond or somewhere with even a beaver lodge. And the incubation period is about 24 to 32 days, but the female will incubate the nest and the males will stay close by and kind of just watch off. And as their animal uh, summer molt uh, takes place during the breeding season, they lose their ability to fly. So they regain flight at the same time that the gooselings are able to start to fly. So let's, uh, that's not what we wanted. Let's have a look at the babies. Have a look at the babies here. So you see that? So as soon as the goslings hatch, they are immediately capable of walking, swimming, and finding their own food. So they are precocial. That's the term for it. Parents will often uh, see in leading their goslings uh, in line, usually with a dot in the front and one in the back. So that's what they do to protect their goslings. And Canada geese are also extremely protective, as you know, and sometimes attack animals nearing their offspring, including humans. And they will enter the fledgling stage at about six to nine weeks of age, and they do not leave their parents until the spring migration, where they return to their uh, birthplace. So we'll have a look at the parents again. So, these guys are known predators such as arctic foxes, coyotes, raccoons, fo uh, crows, black bears, uh, brown bears, and kind of just eaten by everything. Even uh, adults will be uh, hunted by um, grey wolves, uh, goshawks, falcons, things like that. They will really, but they will. And these guys, non-migratory populations have been on the rise in the United States. And they are probably one of the most common waterfowl that you can see in North America. And luckily they have had some protections, but they have been, since they've been uh, so populous, they are legal culls that you can, so they don't um, overpopulate and kind of cause issues, as I mentioned, like polluting water and such, which so they will remove nests, uh, eggs from nests and things like that. And they are protected from hunting outside the hunting seasons at least, and are protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Which is pretty cool. But they're also susceptible to things like, uh, they're also eaten by people, uh, which is a common target for hunters. And also airplanes, airplane strikes can be a big issue for them when they're migrating, but luckily that's not too much of a minor thing that doesn't affect their population too much. And actually in 2000, the North, pop the North American population was estimated to be four to five million birds. So there really is plenty of them. They're not in risk of going in danger. So that's why they are considered least concerned, luckily. And they are found in Winter Canada, the city limits in Wichita, Kansas. Uh, I think that's not in Canada, that's in America. They increased uh, from 1,600 to over 18,000 birds just living in that area. That's a big increase. So yeah, wonderful duck. Not all duck, geese. I think they've got ducks on the mind because of um, all the ducks that we had before. But yeah, we're going to be moving on from... we got another bird coming up, but it's not a duck or a goose. We got a penguin. Let me just take that off. We're going to be moving on to the next one. This was done by Leaf. We've got the Gen 2 penguin here. A really lovely penguin. So, these guys are found in Antarctica. And they are closely related to the Adelaide and the Chinstrap penguin. And you can see that how you differ differentiate them is that they have this kind of... Uh, what would you call it? Like a spectacled white spot that goes around there. Around the head you can see. They really are cute. So they are the Gen 2s. They are not a very big... They're the third largest species of penguin. They are after the Emperor and King Penguin. These guys get to about 51 to 90 centimeters uh, tall. And males have a maximum weight of 8 to 5 kilos just before molting. And a minimum weight of 4.9 kilos before mating. And the females are a little bit smaller, about 4.2 before molting, and they can get down to 1.5, uh, 4.5 as they're guarding their chicks. So birds in the northern part of the range are generally uh, 700 grams heavier and 10 centimeters taller than their southern birds, and southern Gen 2s uh, reach about 75 to 80, so just like slight variation in populations and such. I've already mentioned this guy before, but... The breeding colonies are located on these ice-free surfaces, so they're mainly islands and such. They do kind, they kind of do breed, but they mainly breed on the offshore islands and the Antarctica Peninsula. So they'd be found in places like the Falkland Islands, Kalugan Islands, 
South Shetlands and the Antarctic Peninsula. So that's where they'll be usually found. And the total breeding population is estimated to be 60,000 birds, where they breed monogamously and infidelity is typically punishment, <laughs> punished by banishment of the colony, <laughs> which is quite funny. But yep, don't cheat on your partners, people. And what they do is they gather stones to uh, make their nests and where they lay their eggs. And their eggs will usually uh, both, they usually lay two eggs and their eggs will weigh about 130 grams where the parents will share the incubation duty and the eggs hatch about after 36 days. And the chick will remain in the nest for about 30 days before joining other chicks in the colony and forming creches where the chicks will molt into their subadult plumage and go up to sea at about 100 days old. So these guys are pretty cool. They feed on crustaceans like krill, which makes up 50% of their diet, but they also eat all sorts of fish and lobsters and squids. So they're pretty generalist in that regard. They mainly focus on crustaceans. So these guys are also protected by animals such as leopard seals, sea lions, and killer whales, and uh, giant petrels and skuas will kill their uh, chicks and eggs. So, and also 2019, these guys were considered least concerned because their populations are stable, although there have been rapid declines in some areas. And one big issue for these guys, of course, is climate change, uh, because uh, they rely on the cooler water of the Southern Ocean, which is very, very much full of krill and uh, other food for them, especially whales as well. They Well, they won't eat the whales, but whales rely on this krill. It's a very interesting ecosystem down there. You think there wouldn't be much life, but there is. But these guys really require that, and they need that, and with climate change, that could be in jeopardy. Um, there's also many threats, such as human uh, recreational activities that could impact them, pollution, hunting, fishing. Luckily, those aren't too big, but they can get caught in nets and such. But they are really wonderful birds. How can you not love a good Gen 2? Let's see if you can get one swimming. They're not really swimming at the moment. We'll watch this one swim a little bit. We can take our time. Really wonderful little pingu. So now we're going to be moving on to the next animal. So that was done by Leaf. The next one was done by Brett007, like James Bond, and Janora Pizza. So we've got a really cool animal here. We've got not only a bird, but we've got a reptile. But not only a reptile, we've got a crocodile. So we've got uh, Tommy Stoner, also known as the False Gharial, the Malayan Gharial, or the Sunder Gharial. And these guys are a freshwater crocodile that aren't that closely related to um, your regular gharial that you can see in the game. But they are uh, related to them. They're called false gharials because they're... Mainly just because they have a lot of extinct relatives that uh, have got, of course gone extinct that are between them. They're not that closely related. But these guys are in the genus Tommy Stoner with a few uh, extinct species. But usually these guys are um, just the living species today. It's only living species is the false gharial. So unlike the gharial, these guys have these kind of more broadened snouts. They're kind of like a midway between your gharial, kind of really skinny um, anatomy with the, with the mouth. Then you have the big round uh, or V-shaped with the crocodile. So they kind of um, just kind of met in the middle and had something like that which allows them to be a little bit more generalist with their diet. So, these guys can also get pretty, pretty big. They actually have the longest skull of any crocodile, which is measured about 84 centimeters in length, with a mandibular length of 104 centimeters. So it's a little over a meter long. So, the largest adults, they've been reportedly grew up to about 5 meters long, or 16 feet long. Three mature males kept in captivity were measured at 3.6 to 3.9 meters long, or 11 to 12 feet long, and weighed between 190 and 210 kilograms, where a female was measured, she was 10 feet long, or 3.27 meters, and weighed 93 grams. So the largest female has recorded to lengths of up to uh, 90, what was it, 93 kilograms, yeah, up to 4 meters potentially. And these guys, as I mentioned, they are from Sundaland. So these guys are found in Malaysia, Indonesia, such as Sumatra and Borneo, but were ex um, extirpated or taken out of um, Singapore, Vietnam, and Thailand. It's unclear if they lived in Java, but these guys do enjoy these kind of rivers, including swamps and lakes, 
and they're almost entirely found in peat swamps and lowland swamp forests. And there have been some sightings around Borneo, but we don't really know too much about them. Prior to the 1950s, they occurred in a lot more freshwater ecosystems along the eastern length of Sumatra, but they have been reduced due to logging, uh, fires, hunting, and agriculture. So these guys are pretty generalist in their diet, a lot more than the false gario. I mean, not the false gario, the regular gario. So they usually only just eat small fish and small vertebrates, but they have... That's what they were considered to eat, but now they are considered to eat a lot more than that. They've been seen eating animals like proboscis monkeys, long-tailed macaques, deer, water birds, and reptiles. Even eyewitness accounts of a cow. So that's pretty, pretty interesting. But they seem to be a lot more um, eating of fish and things. A little bit more general than a gario, but, uh, but they will eat like mainly fish and things. But they will go after things like deer and reptiles and monkeys and stuff, as you can see here. So, and a really wonderful animal. How can you not love a gario? So, false garios lay their eggs in a big mount. Um, mound, I mean. And they will uh, lay small clutches of about 12 to 35 eggs and make the largest eggs. They produce the largest eggs of any crocodilian that's alive today, so that's pretty cool. So sexual maturity in females appears to be attained about 2.5 or 3 meters long, which is pretty large compared to the crocodiles and crocodilians. So it's not known whether they, uh, where, when they breed in the wild or when their nesting season is. And once the eggs are laid, the construction of the mound is completed, the female abandons her nest. Unlike most crocodilians, uh, the young receive no parental care and are at risk from all the animals that live in the areas that they live. So places in Sutherland that can include tigers, leopards, wild dogs, mongooses, uh, all those kind of animals. And the young hatch for about 90 days and they tend to fend for themselves. They're one of the few crocodiles that actually don't have parental care, which is pretty interesting. So the threats to these guys, they are considered vulnerable, but the main threat is because they are draining of their freshland swamps that they live in, also clearing of forests, and they're also hunted for skin and meat, and their eggs are harvested for eating, so that can really impact the populations, that's why they're considered vulnerable, and are extirpated from other parts of the population, so luckily some steps have been taken place to uh, try and fix these issues, such as the the Malay government uh, be trying to prevent them, so there have been some populations that have been rebounding in Indonesia, and in slight recovery, and usually trying to get rid of the mostly irrational fear of these guys in the population. And I believe the population alive now is about 2,500 to 10,000 individuals. So luckily, hopefully that goes up more and more and more. We want more gari uh, false gharials in the world. Really wonderful animals. So that was done by uh, Brent007 and Genora Pizza. Next one, we've got a subspecies, pretty much. We have got a really wonderful Roosevelt elk. This was done by Narwhal. So, this is quote-unquote a subspecies. It's not really a subspecies. So, it's also called the Olympic elk or the Roosevelt's white party. So, they're the, one of the largest of the four quote-unquote subspecies that live in America. The thing is that is that they, um, elk that you see here, like Wapati, they only uh, got to America about 15,000 years ago. So, that's not really enough time for them to diverge into different subspecies. But these guys are seem to be a particularly large population, so it's pretty interesting. So these guys are kind of the biggest of them all. They get about 6 to 10 uh, feet in length and stand about 2.5 to 5 feet tall or 1.7 meters tall at the withers, so that should be at their shoulder here. Roosevelt Alts will also typically well weigh the bill, the bull, can't even speak properly. The bulls usually weigh about 7, 700 to 11,000 pounds, or 300 to 500 kilograms, while cows are usually a bit lighter at about 500 to 600 pounds, or 575 to 625 pounds, between 260 and 285 kilograms. And there have been some mature bull, bulls from islands such as the Raspberry Island in Alaska that have reportedly got up to 600 kilos or 1,300 pounds. So that's pretty cool. So during the late spring and early fall, the Roosevelt elk will feed on plants such as sedges and grasses. And during the uh, winter months, they tend to feed on like uh, woody plants such as highbush, cambry, elderberry, devil's club, and such of newly planted seed seedlings of plants like Douglas firs and Western Red Cedar. So the Roosevelt elk is also known to eat uh, blueberries, mushrooms, uh, 
lichens and salmon berries, which is pretty cool. They're very not too different than what you consider elk, they're just a particular population. So in the wild, these guys will live about 12 to 15 years, but in captivity they seem to live much longer, about two and a half years. And they were reintroduced into the Sunshine Coast of Vancouver Island in the 1986. So that's a good example of conservation. So they usually found in the British Columbia, places like that. So they are protected, luckily. And they are obviously named after the uh, American President Theodore Roosevelt, who uh, protected uh, a lot of national parks that they live in. So that's kind of like a great way to honor someone. And they are really wonderful. I love elk. Elk are just so great. So Nawala did a good job. We'll have a look at the female. Wonderful female here. Who doesn't love a good elk? And they've got a really big male too. He's like uh, 83, so he's a big male. Really wonderful animal. So from one subspecies, that was done by Nawala. So we got going from one what subspecies to another subspecies. We've got, but this is by Jen Bubbly Wums and Leaf. We have got the America, uh, not the American, they are American bison, but we've got the wood bison. So here's a wonderful picture of them. So the wood bison, there are two subspecies of American bison. The uh, plains bison, that's the one you kind of normally see, but this one's a little bit more rarer and they're found much more north. They're called the wood bison or potentially the mountain bison. So they are usually found in boreal forest regions such as Alaska, Yucatan, the Northern Territories, British Columbia, Alberta, and Saskatchewan. So they usually live in Canada and Alaska, while the Plains Bison live in the lower 48 states. So these guys are much more primitive in terms of their phenotype uh, compared to the Plains Bison. Since they have this big slope back, they kind of look much more like... Uh, the ancient bison anticus, which is not really a species, it's kind of an old population. They have this like kind of Dorito back, which is really cool, that's like what they resemble. They're also slightly larger and heavier than the woods, uh, plains bison on average. So these guys, their largest, the large males can reach about 3.3.5 meters or 11 foot in body length with 95 centimeters tail, uh, 201 centimeters or 6.5 feet tall, so a little over six foot six at the withers, so that's at the shoulder that you can see here, very, very big. And they can weigh up to 1,179 kilograms or 2,600 pounds in weight. So that's why they look similar to things like step bison and things, so it's really, really cool. So these guys are also herbivorous grazers, they feed primarily on grasses, sedges and forbs. And let's, we'll have a look at the female while they're sleeping. Really nice mod that you made. So, as I mentioned, due to frequent and heavy snowfall in the native habitat as well, the, flux, the food availability fluctuates during the year, so that's why they have such a diverse diet. They'll also eat uh, plants as well, such as uh, silverberry and willow leaves in the summer as well. And they will use their big heads during the winter to try and move snow out of the way so that they can forage. So, wood bison reach sexual maturity at about two years old, and females will often rear their first calf by age two, and may produce a sing single calf every one to two years afterwards. So, mating season typically is around July and September, with most activity occurring during August, as evidenced by the fact most calf calves are born in May. Following a nine-month gestation period, so very similar to humans in that regard, and young bison that we can see here, there's a baby. Cute little bison. Where's the one standing up? Are they all sleeping or they're all running about? We'll have a look. So you can see these young bison. They're pretty much born ready to come out the box. They're able to run uh, pretty much right after they're born with many mastering skills such as evading predators and running and kicking the same day they are born, so that's cool. And reproduction is limited by the amount of habitat available. They tend to disperse when there's not enough food to su sustain a certain population and their population density can decrease. And older bulls will typically have larger ranges than females and they will push younger breeding populations to greater distances. And loss of functional habitat is a major concern due to the density dependence of nature of their reproduction. So sometimes big males may need to be taken out of the population so they won't scare away obviously the females that you need to kind of breed. <laughs> so these guys are also believed to be benefit from the Bergman's rule, which animals living in higher latitudes will um, 
be larger on average, and they are slightly larger on average than the comparable Blaine's Bison. Though it's kind of neither here nor there, kind of. It's kind of generally. Also, they have some other adap adaptations, such as a slightly slower digestion rate or some slight adaptions that they have to be able to be better able to survive in cooler weather. So, although they are native to Alaska and Canada, these guys have been introduced to Russia as part of the. Uh, places like Pleistocene Park where they've been used as an analogue for the extinct steppe bison which these guys are descended from used to kind of like uh, replace them in, in the ecosystem and clear uh, snow and such that's really cool and there's one big issue in their conservation as well has been hybridization with plains bison that potentially may have polluted their stock so between 19... Uh, 25 and 1928 there were about 6,000 plains bison compared to only 2,000 woods bison where they were transferred to the Buffalo National Park in the Wood Buffalo National Park in Canada to avoid the mass culling because they were pretty much hunted ruthlessly if you've heard stories of uh, people in the west kind of just shooting them off the train they were hunted ruthlessly to the point of near extinction but luckily there have been some pure populations and they're pretty sure that these guys are pretty much pure also disease is an issue with their populations were being so low that um there's not much genetic diversity in the population compared to before so that can make them more susceptible and able to adapt to diseases and uh luckily they are doing well the herd population is a total of two and a half thousand uh, due to conservation evident, uh, uh, not conservation efforts due to like, Canada that done a good job and also there's population about a few thousand uh, seven thousand wood bison reside around the Northwestern Territories the Yukon they're not they're not nowhere near as common as the plains bison but they seem to be doing much better than they once did and also as i mentioned being reintroduced into or well, not reintroduced or introduced into uh russia but as part of the pleistocene park project to help replace the steppe bison and clear snow and stuff and kind of be that big megafaunal animal that kind of just helps regulate environments and also it's a very important thing as well that that could actually help climate change if we get enough because they uh oh that's cute interaction but these animals they kind of pack down this ice because the ice is very not the ice the snow is very insulating so once they pack down the ice and snow that kind of reduces the uh, uh what do you call uh, why are my words getting mixed but this kind of reduces the uh, incubation or insulating effect of the snow that's the word and it kind of makes it the permafrost in the ground is less likely to uh melt which causes a lot more carbon to go into the atmosphere so that's very very interesting but luckily these guys are great jen and jen and leaf did a good job of this i think jen makes the mostly made it but uh leaf ports it but this is really wonderful did a great job very nice bison so yeah we're gonna move it on to the second to last animal this was also made by narwhala we have got the blue buck a really wonderful animal so what is a blue buck so the blue buck is an extinct species of antelope it was the first species of antelope to go extinct and was alive until 1800 uh, they are basically closely related to the roan and sable antelopes they were once considered a subspecies but now considered their own species and these guys also these guys are found on like the southern tip of africa but it seems that their population used to be a lot bigger before human uh, intervention they, there have been fossils of these guys found in places like Leslo, so they tend to have a much larger range in Southern Africa, but they were only restricted to kind of like the Cape of Africa when humans came, and that probably restricted them and caused their extinction. So these guys are also pretty big. They get to about uh, 119 centimeters or 47 inches tall in the withers, with the largest specimen. Then there is a specimen that's taller, that's 110 centimeters. Uh, one in Paris that stands 100 centimeters tall and the shortest was a 100 centimeter tall female it was notably shorter than the roan antelopes and kind of the smallest member of the genus that includes kind of roan and sable antelopes so they get the name blue buck because they have this kind of grayish blue coat that you can see here which is contra not contrasted by their flanks 
You can see they've got this brown thing and white uh, patterns on their face. So that really gives them a unique look. And although these, all of these old skins are faded, they're kind of hard to show their original color, but this is probably pretty much what they look like. Really interesting color for an antelope, really look wonderful. And you can see they also have these pretty big horns. So, ears, um, you can see they've got these large horns here. I'm trying to find the, about 56 centimeters is the longest recorded horns from the specimens. So about 56, about 60 centimeters long. They also have large ears, so 23 centimeters and a six meter centimeter long tuft on the end of the tails. Really wonderful. So these guys were suggested that females would actually leave their newborns in isolation and they would suckle their calves uh, on their own until they would join. It's kind of hard to tell their behavior because there weren't really much uh, scientists in uh, Africa at the time that these guys were discovered and described. So it's kind of just kind of hearsay there, but they may have migrated. Uh, but there's also evidence of fossils that they may have migrated. So they kind of migrated from west to east during the summer and they would have consistent of a greater number of older juveniles at the east would have joined the herds so it's kind of a very interesting thing that's going on there and these guys as i mentioned endemic to south africa they were confined to the southwestern cape and it seems like their range was only about 4300 kilometer uh, square kilometers but there have been lots of fossils uh, that have been found that suggest they may have had a much broader range they may be found in Leslo and much other places on the Western Cape. So it looks like they had a much bigger range, but that must have been restricted for whatever reason, potentially climate, um, whatever reason. Hence, this is a very sad role in their extinction. Due to their small range, by the time that the European settlement came about the 17th, 18th century, it kind of caused its decline. They were actually the sole species in the region until 70,000 to 35,000 years ago, with roan antelopes being the predominant one about 11,000 years ago. That could have been with changes since the last glacial maximum. Kind of the warming of the earth potentially may have made the habitat a lot more restricted. That's potentially what could have happened. Since these guys kind of love that Mediterranean kind of um, habitat that was at the Cape, which is pretty cool. And this might have coincided with the grasslands being replaced by bush and forest and reducing the preferred habitat of the bushbuck. So these guys did like grasslands and such. So they really loved the grasslands, so that's probably the last place that they were really found. So it's kind of the end Holocene, the last, they kind of restricted their habitat. And they were hunted by, into extinction by European settlers, sadly. In 1774, they were noted to be increasingly rare, and they believe the German uh, bo um, biologist Heinrich Lustein captured, uh, claimed to kill the last blue buck in 1799 or 1800, and they were the first uh, large African mammal to become extinct, uh, following the quagga, which only died in 1883. That's, but they are considered obviously a subspecies. And at the time of the extinction, they would have. Uh, be known as the Ovbog region in the Western Cape and the IUCN basically considers that the right date of their extinction. So yeah, very sad tale but could come back with um, de-extinction, that's something that's prevalent. Still a really cool animal and you can see the babies here, very cute. So yeah, and we've got Lucky Last. This one was done by quite a few people, that one was, the blue buck was done by Narwhaler but the next animal we've got, the uh, terror bird, you can see here, wonderful. So this one was done by Natty, um, Mega Rex Gaming, uh, Narwhaler and Genora Pizza. This is terror bird. The genus in particular this is based on is Forest Rakus, which is kind of the quintessential terror bird. So what is a terror bird? Terror birds are a extinct group of birds uh, giant flightless birds that lived through the Cenozoic, so I think they went extinct with Titanus in the Pleistocene, even late to mid Pleistocene. And they were predominantly found in South America throughout that time, but the Titanus, as I mentioned, managed to get into North America. So, Forest Rakus lived in the Miocene, so that was about 20 to 10 million, uh, that was about 15 million years time, about, probably about that time. And these guys were the dominant land predator in South America at the time. 
and they kind of lived in woodlands and grasslands where their long legs would have been an advantage for running and catching prey. So Forest Ruckus, as you can see, had a skull here that's about 65 centimeters long, and they stood about 2.4 meters tall, or about almost 8 feet tall, and they weighed about 130 kilograms or 290 pounds, and about the same as an adult male ostrich today. And you can see they have these very long legs that were capable of running at high speeds, and these small wings because they couldn't fly, a long neck with this large head that they use is almost like a hook to try and grab prey. That's what I've caught them with. That's why they can see the huge hooked beak used to stab prey and bite into them. And you can see they have these three toes and each of them was armed with sharp claws. They potentially would have... Their closest living relative, the Seremas, these guys usually kick to get their prey. So it's very likely that these guys would have kicked and hit their prey any way they could to get them down. So these guys' uh, remains have been found in several locations. These guys have been found in Argentina. These guys are found in the mid-Miocene, uh, mid so I believe that's about 10 million years ago. So that's where they're usually found. And the genus name comes from uh, Forest Rakus, so that means kind of wrinkle bearer. And that's referred to their wrinkled jaw structure that you can see here. Which you often see on fossils, that means that kind of supports the keratin of the beak. Which is pretty cool. And there's a couple of holotypes and such, and they've been found other places as well. So you can see here they're part of the group uh, Forest Rockidae, which are an extinct group of giant uh, cursorial or running birds, carnivorous birds, that were the largest land predators in South America. And that lived from the Lower Eocene to the Pleistocene, which uh, they also disperse, as I mentioned, the species, uh, the genus Titanus into the uh, North America through the Great Biotic Interchange about 3 million years ago. And you can just see how wonderful they are. There are also other genuses. There's also like Killing Can, which is slightly larger. Titanus, as I've mentioned, that was kind of the late one. There's a few different genera. You can research into it, but I'll just focus on Forest Arrakis for now. And there is some evidence from Africa and Europe that there have been a clade that is related to these guys. Uh, phylogenetically related to the extent South American Saraimas, but are, um, their assignment re remains controversial. But of course, it's all things paleontology is somewhat controversial. But it seems that these guys, their closest linked relatives, live in South America as well. And they're called Saraimas. They're very, very cool. And they, you can see they're kind of like a smaller version of these guys. They don't have quite large beaks, but they have kicking uh, good feet for kicking they kind of kick their prey and they eat snakes and things and while we're having a look we'll have a look at these cute little babies here and it was, i love the sounds because they're obviously based on cassowaries it's like most likely with the sounds they would have made really really cool cool so yeah really nice job with this one so i believe this will be a great place to end the video now so yeah i really 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 hope you guys enjoy this video i hope you guys like and subscribe Always remember to hit that little bell icon to get notified when I upload anything. So yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. If you guys like and subscribe, and bye bye